welcome to the ESC TV studio. I'm uh, Michael Tandera from Katowice, Poland, and it's my great pleasure to talk with Professor Raimund Erbel from Essen, Germany, who was chairing the task force uh, on aortic diseases. Raimund, could you tell us why would the cardiologist uh, need to look at the entire aorta, not only to the, to the theoretic aorta? Uh, the aorta is uh, a total organ which is going from the aortic valve until the bifurcation of the iliac arteries. And uh, the diseases of the aorta in the thoracic part are often combined with diseases of the abdominal part and vice versa. So our approach this time was really to bring the abdominal aorta to the attention of the cardiologist because he has in his hand a tool very quickly being able to look to the aorta and we did this particularly because there are data showing that screening during a program for men older than 65 years is very helpful to detect uh, the asymptomatic triple A's. Well, probably uh, uh, the most uh, important syndrome that you're describing is generally the acute aortic syndromes. Uh, this includes difficult conditions, but uh, could you please uh, tell us something about the management algorithm that you offer? Yes, the flowchart which we provide in our guidelines should help the physicians in the emergency ward. If somebody is coming with chest pain, he has the clinic examination, the history, and the ECG, and then uh, he can quickly decide whether or not it's an acute coronary syndrome or something else. And if the patient is in an unstable situation, we quickly advise to do echo and to see if it is uh, pericardial fusion and therefore type A or dissection very common or uh, something else and then to do CT or transophageal echo. On the other hand, if the patient is stable, then he showed a probability test which includes clinical features, history features and pain features indicating high or low risk. And whether or not he is at low or high risk, the diagnostic approach is different so that quickly uh, he can come to a final decision whether or not uh, surgery or interventions have to be performed. Well, we, we could have endless discussions on how to handle these patients, uh, but we don't have time for that. How would you summarize uh, uh, the guidelines? What kind of uh, new features would it offer uh, to medical practice? Would it uh, change medical practice at all? It will change medical practice because on one side we have uh, more and more sophisticated endovascular approaches and stimulated by endovascular therapy, surgeons developed new techniques. Uh, previously we did know there is an open elephant trunk, but nowadays we talk about the frozen elephant trunk, so a combination of surgery and endovascular therapy. And uh, we use uh, debranching in order to allow endovascular therapy. So there is really a strong movement concerning new treatment options for uh, patients who otherwise were not really handled very carefully or could not be really handled carefully or had a lot of complications like the paraplegia in type B or the dissection. With endovascular therapy, we can reduce the uh, number and we can reduce the complication rate. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is truly an exciting topic and uh, I think that the cardiology uh, uh, environment, the entire a uh, group of cardiologists, and not only cardiologists, but also cardiac and the vascular surgeons would benefit from this document. Thank you very much for your presence in the studio, and I'll encourage you to use the document in your clinical practice. Thank you very much. Thank you.